Sunday. I mean, you say, well, what is that? What does that mean? Uh, that's Brad being weird and different. Um, but uh, honestly, in the church here, which we follow here every year, if you come to Nature Coast, you are rest assured that uh, next week is the first week of Advent. Um, so we are beginning to celebrate Christmas. We're beginning to celebrate the um, coming of our um, um, the coming of uh, Jesus in a manger as a baby. Uh, we're beginning to celebrate all of that. We, we start the story all over again. If you come to Nature Coast, you can rest assured that every year you're going to hear the story of Jesus um, throughout each week. And that will include um, Christmas and his birth. It will include his baptism, his miracles, his temptations. Um, it will lead us up to Holy Week and Good Friday and Easter, and then it'll be his ascension, and then it'll be Pentecost when he poured it out, and now we're in ordinary time. And I always get emotional during um, this week of the year because for me and for Nature Coast and kind of the story we live and tell, this is the last Sunday of the church year. And the last Sunday of the church year, we are always reminded that not only in the story of Jesus, but we've all lived a year since the last November. We have all lived our lives. Um, our lives, as we said in our call to worship, have been filled with uh, blessings. They've been filled with disappointments. Um, but the reason we and the church reminds ourselves that Christ is the, uh, Christ the King Sunday is that at the end of it all, His kingship has the last word in our stories and in our lives no matter what you've been through, the story of Jesus, you know, sometimes I think when we come to church, we actually come to church because we think, okay, I got a week ahead, it's Thanksgiving week, that's rot with all kinds of problems or busyness or anxiety. I need to come to church so that I can just make sure and fit Jesus into my Thanksgiving week. Actually, when you come to worship together with people, you are actually being reminded that you aren't fitting Jesus into your story. You fit into his story. It's a, it's a revolutionary way to actually look at life. Um, you're not plugging him in to your life. You're not plugging him into your week. You fit into whatever story he has. And that's kind of where we are going. Um, Don't Label Me is the um, title of my message. None of us like to be labeled. And as I reflect on this last year and I reflect on our story as a church, um, if you're new here, that's okay. Um, if you're visiting for the first time, that's okay. But as you reflect on your own story, um, as you reflect on your personal story, you reflect on the church's story, you reflect on your um, family stories all throughout this year, um, we've tried to define ourselves in various ways. And we come up with definitions for our own story. Um, we have labels. Uh, we personally don't like to be labeled. Um, it's not something that we like, but I actually find it interesting that while I don't like to be labeled, I like to label other people. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the, the vicious cycle we kind of find ourselves in? I mean, we all can, um, uh, uh, you know, resonate with um, that don't label me. Um, uh, we, we don't like to be defined, and yet in so many ways, we, we have labeled even ourselves. Uh, we may have even labeled uh, this year, um, we may have labeled our, our identities, um, but we don't like... Uh, to be labeled. And um, it's interesting because our text is in John. It's interesting because it's Christ the King Sunday, so we're actually, our text is in the middle of Passion Week. This is right in the middle of Jesus' trial, and he's before Pilate. And they're going to talk about Jesus being a king, which is why um, we're in this particular text. Um, but I want to do something a little bit different. Um, you won't actually find me talking per se too much about Christ being the king. Um, we will at the end, um, certainly. But what does he do as king? And Jesus doesn't allow himself to be labeled by Pilate here. Um, in fact, he kind of refuses titles. But one of the things that was true of the story of Nature Coast over the last year 
is just our church story. And um, this, this idea that, that our king is a wonderful counselor. And, um, and I think there's a lot of counseling going on here with Pilate for us. And um, so it makes it kind of odd. Jesus is cryptic which will frustrate us about this text, which makes it frustrating um, to even talk on. Um, But I think there's a lot more going on here. But part of this last year for us included a transition out of our denomination. And um, it's interesting, that happened in the middle of July. I said this at the first service. You know, when we were um, transitioning out of our denomination, um, and all of that was going on, so we started that process like in March or, or whatever. But when you ever make a change, people are always wondering, all right, what's the real story here? What's really going on? What's the hidden agenda? Well, it is November whatever, 21st. That happened on July 18th. And for those of you who come to Nature Coast... Has anything changed? No, because there was no hidden agenda. But in the midst of that, in the midst of the fear of change, in the midst of all of this, one thing that happens when change happens is questions arise. And I learned a lot through um, the transition. Um as we went, and, and, and maybe I'm learning, um, I, I humanly have had a wonderful counselor um, in my life, and um, we're going to talk about that, because we all have questions. We probably even have questions for Jesus, and I believe they can be helpfully, this passage can be helped by going all the way back to the beginning of the Bible. God made the world, God uh, made a garden, in the midst of the garden there were lots of trees, there was one tree humanity wasn't supposed to eat of, it's not really what the sermon is about, but every time I come up to this I always remind you what was the name of the tree that God did not want us to eat from. The name of the tree that God did not want us to eat from was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So if you were just logically following that out, what do you think God never wanted humanity to know? The knowledge of good and evil. You don't even have to believe the Bible to see that the trajectory of humanity from the beginning, what destroys nations, what causes war, what causes division amongst humanity, the knowledge of good and evil. We got to be right. And Jesus never wanted us to know the knowledge of good and evil. We did. We partook. When humanity partook of that, it says we became like God, and we now knew the knowledge of good and evil, but here's the problem. We're not God. And so we hid. And you want to know what the first question of the Bible is? Where are you? Where are you? Now, that isn't because God lost Adam and Eve in the garden and said, whoo, we're playing hide and seek, and I don't know where you are, and I want to go out and find you. He asked the question because he wanted Adam and Eve to begin some self-reflection and begin to ask the question. He really is, what he's saying is, Adam and Eve, do you know where you are right now? Do you know what you've done? Do you know, do you know where you are? And ever since Genesis, that's been the posture of God toward humanity. He always wants our heart. And 
And that creator shows up in a trial and ticks us all off. So we're going to read uh, from that. Pilate is there. Uh, Pilate uh, is, uh, you got Jesus. Um, you just leave it on the slide till I'm, I'm done. Pilate has Jesus before him. Pilate asks Jesus the question, are you the king of the Jews? Um, and, and Jesus, this is always true. This is always true. Um, this is part of, of Jesus grabbing our hearts. I actually think as I was preparing today, and, and one of the things is we've gone through COVID, and we've even grown as a church, and we have a soul care team that kind of um, works in our relationships and, and works with people. I always find this uh, to be good, and I've said this before. Anytime Jesus is asked a question in the Bible, he never gives a yes or no answer. In fact, he rarely answers the question. He doesn't. I mean, you read it over and over again. He'll never say yes. He'll never say no. He doesn't answer this question, and that is frustrating. And, and, and I think the reason he is doing it here and the reason um, he is doing it with Pilate, just think back to the garden. Pilate asked Jesus a question, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, where are you, Pilate? You're asking me a question, but that question says more about you than it does me. And I am your wonderful counselor here, and I am not going to answer the question because I want to unpack you. I want to unpack your heart. I'm not going to just give a yes or no answer to this question. I want to unpack you and your heart. And, and we do the same thing, and there's nothing more frustrating to that. I actually did learn that through the transition, early on in the transition. Of course, when you're transitioning um, out of a denomination and, and, and your church, um, people, they want to know what the hidden agenda is. They want to know what's, what's, uh, what's driving you or whatever. So invariably, as we were moving on, I would get these boatload of questions, and people in the church would get these boatload of questions. Um, and, um, um, and, 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 and you would think that they're normal questions. Questions such as, well, what do you be, believe about the Lord's table now? What do you believe about baptism? What do you believe about drums? What do you believe about women? What do you believe about the gifts of the Spirit? What do you believe about this? What is your view about this? And what is your view about this? And, and I began to answer, and if you came to any of the transition meetings, people would ask those questions, and I would stand right here, and I would say, I'm not answering that. Not getting an answer. Because for the most part and for the reality, and I know we do that. Some of you may be visiting here. It says, why I come to church? I need to know what the pastor believes. I need to woe. You know what? I went to Nature Coast Church this morning, and I asked the pastor what his views were, and he said, it's none of your business. I mean, who has a church like that? But honestly, I think that's what Jesus, Jesus would have been infuriating to us. He would have been infuriating to us. And one thing I began to realize, and I began to unpack, and it didn't work so well when I was asked these questions. When, those, when someone asked me what my view is, that is a reflection more about them. The question's more about them than it is about me. Because you know Why? Here's the reality that Jesus is unpacking with Pilate. He's unpacking with us. And yes, we're kind of dealing with human heart and relationships here um, this morning as we walk through this particular text. But here's the thing. If you ask me or anyone or you ask Jesus even what his, I mean, he was asked his views too. Should we give to Caesar or not? Well, under Caesar, things are Caesar's. God's God's. You know, he's infuriating. How many times should I forgive? Well, ah, forgive three times. Well, that's 70 times seven. I mean, you just go on and on. Well, I've, I've kept everything. What more do I, Well, I'll sell everything you have. <laughs> it, it begins to be infuriating because one of the things that under, under, just use me as an example, under the question of whatever it is my view is, is probably fear. I don't want to go to the wrong church. I don't want to have the wrong pastor. I 
I mean, that's the foundation of church world, isn't it, right? I mean, some of you may be even here evaluating me here this morning. You say, well, I went to that church. And what Jesus would say to you, if you ask that question, he would say, why are you afraid? So what if you go to the wrong church? So what if you have the wrong pastor? I mean, that's like blasphemy, right? Who says that? Who cares if you go to the wrong church? I want to know what's in your heart. Why are you afraid? Why can't you just go to church and believe that Jesus plus nothing equals everything? I am here to give you rest. I mean, that is just crazy. And, and you know what kind of crazy that is. I said this during COVID. We think Jesus would actually give us an answer. Jesus, 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 should we wear masks? Should we get a vaccine? Should we not get a vaccine? And Jesus would stand there and not answer. Because Jesus will never allow anyone to come into his presence and feel good and right when they leave that their rest rests in having the right answer. We do that all the time. Look at all of our lives. Look at our marriages. Look at our relationships. Man, if you'd have just told me that, I, I wouldn't have gotten so angry. We need to communicate better. What is that saying? Jesus is saying what that saying is, is you can only have peace when you have communication and you have an answer. And so our peace and our rest rest in explanations. We all do it. I want to know why this was done. And I can't have peace. In fact, I will be angry till I know. Most of the time when you do know, it just makes you angry, which is also why Jesus keeps his mouth shut half the time too. Jesus is offering Pilate so much more. And I know you, just, you can be spinning at this point thinking, that's not the world I live in. Well, Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. Paul, he hits Pilate. Is that your own idea? Like, Pilate, where are you? Is that coming from your heart? Or did other people ask you to say that to me? I mean, and even if Pilate pulls out the, oh, yeah, other people asked me to say it's not coming from my heart. Well, then he's got the issue. Then why did you do? What about your heart that just makes you do what other people ask you to do? I mean, the whole thing's being unpacked. Pilate's done. He's toast. Pilate starts to get upset. You can go to the next slide. He says, am I a Jew? Like Pilate says, no, I'm not a Jew. Oh, I forgot to change the slides between... I got so busy doing service. There's a mess up in the next slide, Jason. So I think it's from last week or a prior week or something. Um, Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. So when I leave this slide, you'll skip the next slide and go to the next slide because I think they're they're in order. Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. No, not yet. Not yet. (laughs) Yeah, not yet. But when I do get there. I see you deleted it now. So I am ready to go. I can see he knows what he's doing back there. Anyway. Am I a Jew? Like, Pilate gets frustrated. Like, I'm a Jew. I don't know those answers. Your priest chiefs betrayed you, and they handed over to me. What is it that you've done? Look at Pilate. Everyone wants to, everyone wants to wash their hands. So the Jews and the religious people sent them to Pilate because they want to kill Jesus. They want Pilate to kill Jesus. And so that's why they sent Jesus to Pilate. But they don't want it on their hands. They want to be right. So they're going to let someone else be wrong. Pilate doesn't actually want to kill Jesus. He is like in these questions, like like he's giving Jesus all this wiggle room. Like here's some wiggle room. Why don't you take the wiggle room and get out of this and make my life easier? And then I can go home tonight and my wife, as we find out, she won't be so upset and and I will be okay. And and in the end, what is Pilate doing? He's washing his hands because everyone wants to be right by the law. Everyone wants to be right by an explanation, and, and Jesus just won't ever let us go there. 
He won't ever let you and I go there and are feeling right. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. This is my servants, my followers. Pilate actually knows the answer to this question because the thing that's perplexing to Pilate is he's being presented as this kind of insurrection guy, which the Romans didn't like. Pilate was Rome and they, they were Jews being presented to that. But then Jesus shows up and Pilate himself is wondering, well, where, where's the insurrection? Where's the followers? And Jesus is actually, this is kind of funny given the context. This is just a portion of it. You know, my kingdom is not of this world. If, my, if it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest. My followers would fight to prevent my, my arrest. Well, like uh, one of his followers just a few verses before this has denied him to a, to a servant girl. I mean, Jesus has no followers at this point. There's no one fighting for him because he is this crazy but my kingdom has come from another place. And this is very, very interesting. You, you can't go to the next slide now. So Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. So when Jesus says, my kingdom is out of this world, what does that imply? Well, that Jesus has a kingdom. And this is, this is interesting because he says, you are a king then. That's what Pilate said. And Jesus never let himself to be labeled. Jesus never, here's what he said. Jesus answered, well, you say that I am. Again, where's your heart? It's not about what I say. Not going to be about what the answer I give. Not going to be about me giving you some explanation. Isn't that what we would want Jesus to do? If Jesus were in most churches and most counseling, well, you're there before Pilate and he asked you and you kind of said your kingdom was of a different world. Why couldn't you take the time to explain to Pilate, now, Pilate, I really am a king, but the kingdom is kind of different. And here's how the kingdom is different. Um, and this is what I'm, I, I'm going to do. And, and Pilate could have all these facts to work with or not, but Jesus just remains uh, cryptic. And finally, he says, Pilate says, well, I just heard you. You said you were a king. And, and Jesus just says, you said it. Again, he wants to know what's in Pilate's heart. doesn't really matter what I declare myself to be. I want to know what's in your heart, Pilate. You say that I am a king. And he says this, and this is where we'll wrap up. You say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason we're going to be celebrating Advent next week, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. You can leave it on this slide. Everyone on this side of truth, everyone literally who belongs to me, who belongs to the truth, listens to me. Jesus seems to be frustrating again. The reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to me. Now, when you hear that, what begs the question then? Does that make any sense to anyone? Would have it made sense to Pilate? I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to me. What are you pulling your hair out then asking Jesus? What do you want to know? What is truth? And Pilate, as representative of humanity, next slide, immediately says, what is truth? He's upset. He retorted. And the next few verses, Jesus takes a 10-minute sermon and unpacks for Pilate what the truth is. Nope. Not a word. Not a word. With the question that all humanity wants to know.
as Jesus. <laughs> we'll live out in the next few hours. The truth will unfold before everyone's eyes. Pilate is frustrated. The Jews are raging. And the very next verses, Pilate comes up with a solution that he thinks will set him free. Well, it's the custom that I turn over someone and I got this really, 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 really bad guy. And this really, really bad guy, they'll never let him go because he's killed some of their very own folks, maybe even killed some of their children. His name is Barabbas. So it's kind of custom that I let someone go. So I'm going to put out there a guy who's killed some of your own children, and I'll put out Jesus, and certainly you don't want the guy who's killed your own kids to be set free. Surely you just choose Jesus because what I can see he seems like a quack to me. The truth is, is that God showed up as a baby at Christmas time and lived his earth. The truth is that God showed up and we killed him. That's the truth. And for that reason, he was born. He was born so that he could testify to the fact that the people he came to say so saved, so hated him, he killed him. They killed him. We killed him. He came to testify to the fact that we are so steeped in our own need to be right, our own need to be righteous, that we hate anything that makes us rest on the righteousness of others so much that we will kill God. And then he also came to testify to the truth that even the people who I created, who I have always asked where they are, and who have always ran from me and always rejected me, I testify to that truth that the world I created hated me, but I also testify to the truth that while that world I created hated me, my love was greater and I am going to die for those who hate and reject reject me. That's the truth. And the truth isn't just that set of facts because here's the reality. Everyone who belongs to the truth, what does that imply? You can't really belong. I don't belong to this notepad. I don't even belong to the words on this notepad because these word, words on the notepad, they aren't alive. And the, and the notepad um, is, is not alive either. I, I, you belong to the truth. And what, is, what do you do when you ask what is truth and the truth is actually standing in your presence? Because it's not a fact. Truth is not a set of facts. It's not a set of values. It's not a set of right and wrongs. The truth is a person. And that person's name is Jesus, who earlier, just a few chapters earlier, had said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no man can be connected with the Father but by me. I am a living, breathing human truth. And if you belong to me, you'll hear my voice and you'll say, my shepherd, my sheep hear my voice. And what's his voice? You will hear about my love. You will hear about my grace. For you. Jesus is so confounding. But you may have come here this morning with all sorts of questions. You may have come here this morning wanting answers to those questions. You may have come there this morning wishing that Jesus was standing before you and not me. But whatever question you would have for Jesus, his first order of counseling business would not be to answer your question. It would be to say, where are you? Do you know where you are? Why did you ask that question? What are you afraid of? What are you upset about? Because here's the truth. Whatever you are afraid of and whatever you are upset of, I am greater than that and my love is greater. 
and I am the way, the truth, and the life. I've come to the conclusion, even in the midst of the transition, in the end, it really doesn't matter what I believe about any of those things I mentioned. It really doesn't, and I would say it doesn't matter to you. Because the only thing that matters is Jesus and Him alone. And He's come for you. And He's come for me. And He offered Himself to Pilate and to the people. And He refused a title. And He refused to be labeled. Because the labels we give each other and the labels we give Jesus say more, much more about our heart than they do about him. Humanity's always wanted to label Jesus. Moses did. As an example in the Old Testament, Moses is a burning bush. God wants Moses to go to the big Pharaoh and say, let my people go like to the God of the world, the most powerful man in the world. You just walk right in there, Moses, and you tell him, you puny little Moses, you just walk right in there and tell him to let my people go. And Moses gets what he's about to do. He doesn't really want to do it, but he finally says, okay, I'm going to go. But like, who, can I tell him who sent me? Can I tell him you're like the biggest, baddest dude around and you better listen to me? And I'm the biggest bad dude. Tell them I'm the creator of the world. And I'm all of this. You tell them that. God refused to be labeled at the burning bush because you know what he told Moses? Say, you go to Pharaoh and just say, I am sent you. I'm like, what? What? Pharaoh, I am sent me. No explanation. No label. How do we testify the truth? Jesus says you can testify the truth. My body and my blood till I come again. You testify to yourself and you testify to the world that God loves sinners and eats with them. See, that's really the truth that was promised in Genesis 3. Humanity needed deliverance. God promised deliverance, and Jesus was there. That's the truth, and there's no hope without it. You see, the truth is, honestly, this is the truth, that Christ's blood has been shed for you. His body has been broken for you. And that's all that matters. He's for you. All the other questions. You know, we make these other questions. Like when we get to heaven. Father's going to ask us, well, you can't come to heaven until you tell me what your view of drums were. Well, you can't get to heaven unless you tell me what your view of the gifts were. Here's the truth of the matter. Even I was raised in a tradition that taught me, well, if God saw you and said, why should I let you into my heaven, what would I say? And theoretically, here's the factual, truthful answer. Here's the set of facts. That you died on the cross, and my only hope is Jesus, and I can get in. That's true. Please don't say someone in Brad said I went through, blah, 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 after you leave here. But here's the truth of the matter. I believe that question, first of all, won't even be asked. But if it were asked of me, Brad, why should I let you into my heaven? I believe my answer and all answers should be, you promised and you do not lie because you're the truth and I belong to you. That's crazy, isn't it? But it's the crazy truth. So whoever's helping to serve, come. Please come. How do we do this here? You can come. Um, anyone can come. Um, anyone who wants to know Jesus, 
um, because the truth will be spoken to you in person, his body, his blood for you. He is for you. This truth isn't against you. This truth is for you. Um, and, um, and so as you come, uh, we would love to have you come um, and uh, take of the bread. We don't dismiss rows. You just kind of get up and come. If you can't get up and come, when people are done serving, like wave your hands and Morgan or someone will run out and greet you um, and, uh, um, and let you partake in that way. So come. By the way, before I close, um, I didn't talk about Christ being the king. He is a different kind of king. That is true. Um, but every year we close out our church year with this anthem, um, which is kind of played to the tune of a song we sing at the end of every calendar year. Um, but it's all glory be to Christ the King. So as you partake, uh, go back and continue to stand um, and, and sing with us as we close out our church year. All glory be to Christ. Happy New Year. I know it's not yet. I know we got Thanksgiving and Christmas to go. But one thing we proclaim in my heart's longing is that for the next 52 Sundays, I doubt anyone will make them all. I won't make them all here. <laughs> but when you do, all glory will go to Christ. And not because we're right. No glory to Nature Coast Church. No glory to Brad. No glory to our programs. All glory be to Christ our King. And whatever this new year brings, his infinite love has the final word. And we can rest in that. Go in peace. Amen.